Millions of families are devastated by this disease. I'm going to read some uh, facts. One out of every nine people that are 65 years or older has the disease, Alzheimer's. And even more are forced to watch as someone they love slowly disappear. But World Alzheimer's Day is an inspiration and a reminder that hope is on the horizon. There are people both locally, and you'll meet them today and in the world, that are working very hard to try to find what, how you get Alzheimer's. I guess we don't really know how you get it. Um, right now, the problem with Alzheimer's is there's no cheap or easy accessible <laughs> way to determine if someone has a disease. A lady came in this morning, she says he hasn't been uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but we think that there's something wrong. And that's usually when you can tell that something is going on. I'm hopeful that doctors will soon have several new tools. I know there's people working on a, the most simplest tool would be to do a blood test, right? With your blood, you can do you can get so much information. Um, but there's also a smartphone app that people are working to develop to try to figure out what is going with Alzheimer's. Today, we have Dr. Maestra, who is local. She's at the University of Texas, and she's doing research on Alzheimer's, especially in Hispanics. And she'll be talking to you. We have Jenny from the Alzheimer's Association. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's our annoying. <laughs> well, not really, but okay. <laughs> forgive, forgive me, Jenny. But um, she's going to be talking to us about what's going on at the Alzheimer's Association and what we're doing to make things a little bit more pleasant, a little bit better. Keep up with some research and see what's going on with that. So I think we're going to start with Jenny and right. Yeah, we're going to start with her and she's going to. She's on. She's. I think she's in San Antonio. She is, but which is great because she didn't have to come down here. But she is a director of programs for the San and South San Antonio South Texas chapter. San Antonio South Texas chapter, and she's also very involved in what Maxine is trying to do down here in the valley. Okay, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Rose. Mm -hmm. Jenny, I'm gonna go ahead and pass on to you the mic so that you can start uh, your presentation. Okay, good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. New man in the room. Well, oh, I'm so glad to, to be with you this morning, even though it is virtual and um, just really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share some of the latest in research, which um, I do love it when we talk about research because it's not just off somewhere in Sweden. It's all over the United States. It's all over our state of Texas, and it's most definitely happening in the southernmost part of our chapter in South Texas, in the upper and Rio Grande Valley. So just really appreciate being able to... Um, Kind of show you though, kind of on a on a bigger scale, what's happening in the world of Alzheimer's research, and I'm going to kind of go quickly because there's a lot of information. I will show you at the end where all of this information is at. Just very quickly, the Alzheimer's Association. There's our mission statement. We we are all about people and science. That's what our logo represents. So if you've ever seen us wear the little lapel pens or if you would like one, you know that is what represents the Alzheimer's Association. So you know which organization it is. And it, it's basically an abstract symbol that represents people in science. We are all about helping people who are already on this journey and also um, funding research studies all over the world so that we can have a cure for this disease. We can have treatments. For people who currently have it and we can have prevention for everyone in the future. 
So this just tells a little bit about what I'm going to be going over today. So we'll just go right past that. Um, every year, the Alzheimer's Association publishes facts and figures. So if you happen to be a statistical person and you want some information on numbers, our, our organization every March, um, after a year of, of updating, going through, going through the vetting process of every organization, um, collecting as much data as possible, these are the latest facts and figures, some of the kind of main ones um, from 2021. We know that Alzheimer's disease continues to be the most expensive disease in the United States. We know that um, when we're looking at diversity, equity, inclusion, we have much more to do to reach populations that are absolutely more affected by the disease. And we know that just in the United States, there's more than 6 million Americans who are living with Alzheimer's disease. And that's just Alzheimer's disease. That number does not count all of the other dementias. And we do represent all of the other dementias as well. Um, we know that the COVID um, pandemic of the last year has year and a half, or gosh, I can't even keep track of how many months it's been have absolutely caused um, this to be so much worse than it already is. And so we have, um, in since March, a lot more information about how COVID has affected um, families, also the amount of increase in death rates. So again, this report or some of kind of the, the highlights or, or um, other statistics, you can find all of this on our website. I'm going to keep going. Um, one of the special reports that, that did come out with our facts and fig figures is that there are significant disparities. We know that there are also significant disparities in the people who sign up and who participate in research trials. So we definitely want to make a push for that today as well. Um, we know that two thirds of Americans living with Alzheimer's disease are women. We still don't know the exact reasons for that. Um, so there's a lot more studies now looking at this, the difference between men and women, which I'm sure we can all say some of those things, but there's there's something going on there more than just the fact that, that women live longer, have longer life expectancy than men. We know that older individuals who are Hispanic and African American disproportionately have more Alzheimer's and dementia that is developed than their Caucasian counterparts. And we also know there's such under underrepresentation in clinical studies. Um, lots of reasons for this, but again, um, you're going to hear so much more from today's uh, other presenters and, and all of the things that are happening there in your community. So I will we'll keep going, but very, very exciting things. Um, this is just, we just always like to show this in every presentation that we do in case, um, you know, the most commonly asked question we still get, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's and other, other irreversible causes of dementia? Dementia is the big, broad umbrella term. As you can see underneath, those are the four most prevalent causes of dementia symptoms. A lot of times in research, um, studies are not just looking at individuals who have Alzheimer's disease, but certainly vascular, Lewy body, uh, frontotemporal. There's so many other causes. So all of these are very, very important. And just just because the name, the shortened name of our organization is Alzheimer's Association, we certainly represent all other uh, irreversible dementias. So I'm going to keep going. We know that when we look at cognitive impairment, there is so much more now being done to look at younger individuals because there is, there's a, there's a, a continuum of impairment and absolutely everyone starts with being cognitively unimpaired and what we know though is that mild cognitive impairment 
oftentimes develops later into mild, moderate, and dementia, including Alzheimer's disease and the other most prevalent dementias. Uh, what we what we know and what's really important is that with MCI in the beginning process, there are a lot more studies being done now to be able to understand um, looking across this continuum that a lot of times research has focused on maybe older individuals or individuals who are in moderate to later stages. Now, um, really looking at with mild cognitive impairment, um, everyone who experiences dementia will have passed through mild cognitive impairment, but not everyone who has mild cognitive impairment later goes on to develop dementia. So if we can right there in that second area have um, interventions, whether it's medications or other things that can either slow the progression or stop it right there in mild cognitive impairment, we can have a, a huge impact. And I'll, I'll show a little bit more in a slide coming up what we, what we see coming down the future. Um, again, MCI known risk factor for dementia. If we can prevent new cases of MCI, we can prevent new cases of, of Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, we know uh, plaques and tangles still considered the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. It's really kind of hard to look at that photo, but um, it's just, it's, a, it's an incredible representation of what brain diseases actually do to the brain that um, I just had a, uh, we had a support group and one of the family members said, I feel like my loved one is manipulating me, that all of this is just manipulation. And so it's really important to, to take classes, to learn more about what these diseases physically actually do to destroying cells in the brain. Showing this can really show, okay, just keeping that mantra of, it's the disease, it's not the person, it's not something they can have control over. So when we look at risk, we know that there are non-modifiable risk factors, the things that can't be changed. Like it or not, we are aging every single day. So we know that goes over there. We know that our genetics, we are born with what we are born with. We know that family history, same thing. But more and more, there are studies, and I'll show you one of those in particular, that are looking at what about the modifiable risk factors? What about things that we can do to control the possibility of later um, not developing Alzheimer's and dementia? When we look at things like cardiovascular disease, um, education, social and cognitive engagement, if one thing COVID has certainly had an impact on is our social engagement in the last year and a half. And this is so significant for how the brain, what the brain needs. And so um, next on the list, modifiable is diet. What we put into our bodies very significantly has an impact on our heart health and therefore our brain health. Um, exercise, exercise is still pretty much at the top of the list for something that we have control over that can have an impact and um, reducing um, risk factor and also sleep. There's, as you may have heard, there's a lot more studies now looking at the importance of sleep. Just talking about risk factors, things that we absolutely can't change, but everything that can be modified, those are areas where research is, is definitely significantly looking at. Um, now, depending upon where we are on Zoom, you may not, I can't even see it on this slide, but on the far right is the uh, most recent um, FDA approved uh, therapy for Alzheimer's disease. So this just kind of looks at Alzheimer's in particular has been around since 1906. That's a picture of Dr. Alzheimer. That's when you're so brilliant, they name it. At, they name something after you if you discover something. Well, he discovered this this disease, named it, and since then, these are the FDA-approved medications for truly the symptoms of dementia. But they haven't actually.
stopped or um, um, kept the disease from progressing. So they're they're not a prevention, and they're certainly not considered a a true therapy that stops it in its place. This year, as you as you may have heard, um, aducanumab or kind of the the public name is Aduhelm was approved after FDA approval of clinical studies that showed particularly in individuals in early stages, there was actually some slowing of the progression of the disease. So when they looked at, for someone in the early stages to have a period of time where they stayed longer in the earlier stages of the disease, it was significant enough for FDA to approve it. So in, in many ways, this was the, the absolute breakthrough um, first time that we can actually say um, specifically a therapy for Alzheimer's disease. And it was a granted approval on June 7th of this year, um, underlying the biological and the, and the biology of Alzheimer's disease. We know that it targets and reduces amyloid plaque in the brain of individuals with Alzheimer's. And the treatment was um, studied in people living with uh, early Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. Um, and much more to come on this. We are currently advocating very strongly as a nationwide organization that the, the cost is prohibitive to everyone and it's, it is not unlike when the very first therapy for cancer was FDA approved and hit the market. It was um, a situation where a lot of advocacy was needed to be able to have insurance cover it and, uh, and Medicare, et cetera. So we're in that process right now. A lot more to come on that. Our website is full of information on Aduhelm if, if you do want to um, learn more about it. What I want to show next is some of the specific studies that are happening. We know that at any given moment, there are discoveries that are happening around the world. Right now, um, where we are at, the Alzheimer's Association is the largest nonprofit funder of, of research. We work very closely with the funding that comes from our federal government that goes into the National Institutes of Health, National Institutes of Aging. But we are also in the, um, in the position to be able to fund worldwide. And of course, our money stays here in the United States. So right now, the Alzheimer's Association currently has 235 million um, invested in um, activities across this has actually been updated. It's now over seven, I think it's 730 different projects in 39 different countries. So that's where we are as of this year with um, research studies. Advocacy, this slide again, I don't know if you can see the far right, but it, it's really significant in that it shows that in a very short amount of time, due to the advocacy efforts of individuals like all of us, all of you, we can make a difference in getting more funding for Alzheimer's and, and other dementias. And that, that is what's causing the change and will cause the change in our future. It was not even, I mean, 2011, the funding for Alzheimer's was at $448 million. That is, um, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling. Now, scoot forward to 2021, there's more than 3.2 billion that is funded from our federal government from the budget to be able to fund specifically in the United States different studies. And um, I'm very excited to show you this next slide because in our chapter area, which covers 43 counties all the way absolutely to the southernmost tip of Texas, um, we, our chapter has received grants. There are current grants. Um, there have been nine awards given since 2007. Um, 1.5 um, million, actually this is, this is 
we need to update this as well. We have over a million dollar um, research active in just our chapter area. We have um, 23 different volunteer um, scientists who review um, and then 324 different critiques that have been different, that have been, um, everything has to go through a process before it can, before research studies and the results can get published. And so this shows in our chapter how involved um, researchers have been. Right now we have 25 iStart members. iStart is, is a member organization for professionals. Um, and then funded researchers, certainly UT Health, um, UTSA, Trinity University. Um, and so the, I've got to update the slide because there's even more research that uh, we just had another approval of um, another study here within our chapter. So it is a very exciting time in research. Let me go through this. Biomarkers are certainly, um, we're going to hear more and more and more about biomarkers changing the game. Um, biomarkers, you may not be familiar with the word, but you definitely have, um, the, the concept is if you've ever taken a cholesterol test or a blood sugar test, well, those are, those are biomarkers for things like heart disease and diabetes. And so a biomarker is something that you can measure in the body that tells you something about a disease process. And for almost a hundred years, there were no biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Um, now, due to advances in, in research, in science, the ability to do PET and um, uh, FDA approval of brain imaging, there are so many more things, more tools that are being developed. Um, look, there's the possibility of looking at cerebral spinal fluid, blood tests, eye tests, saliva tests. So all of those things are very significant. Um, to be able to, again, um, understand so much more about the disease and, and where the process is in the brain. Modernizing the diagnosis, looking at now it, it is estimated that Alzheimer's disease can may very well be in the brain 20 mm -hmm. years or more before symptoms appear. Um, so when you when um, when Rose was sharing the statistics about specifically after the age of 65, the numbers um, very much skyrocket of individuals who have Alzheimer's and other dementias. Um, they're now wanting to really look at, OK, is it possible then that the symptoms don't occur until later years in life? but the actual damage to the brain started much, much, much earlier. So there's a lot more studies looking at younger individuals. The landscape of clinical trials, uh, phase one, two, and three, um, as this is as of April, there were um, you just kind of at a glance looking at at least 129 different studies in phase one, 191 in phase two. 62 in phase three. So again, at any given moment, there are research studies that are happening and they they need people to participate. So if you are interested in learning about research and if there's anything that you might be of, of help and a match with for any research studies, uh, Trial Match is a nationwide database that is, it's a matching service between the public and all um, clinical studies. And so you can, okay, thanks Maxine. You can um, either call our helpline or go to alz.org slash trial match, put in your information and the system will see if just initially you might be a match for a study. Studies are being done, not just on medication, but um, quality of life studies. Um, I got, I'll remember the day I got a match for trial match and I didn't even have to leave my office. It was an online survey, but they, whatever I had put into my, um, into my um, platform for myself was a match for a clinical study. So I was able to participate. So um, just really want to encourage, they need people who have dementia, diseases, people who don't, who have it in their family, who don't have it in their family for, for
for the control side of studies. So really a lot of studies and, and all of them need participants. So trial match is how you can find that out. Um, there are certainly more uh, research studies looking at um, what about for individuals? Um, there's just not enough. We know there's not enough support. There's not enough assistance in um, clinical symptoms and behavioral and psychological um, things that can happen that, again, we're not just talking about medications, but looking at um, sleep studies and, and how can we um, have better care for individuals as oftentimes these are some of the um, effects that can happen. So a lot more studies in these areas. Um, new targets, there's heart the cloud, there's certainly looking at, you've probably heard of neuroinflammation, that's an area of um, significant study looking at, again, how, how does our vascular system have such a huge influence on our brain. I want to get to the the Sprint Mind study was specifically a study that looked at blood pressure and being um, in a situation where lowering blood pressure over time significantly decreased um, risk for mild cognitive impairment and dementia symptoms. So addressing cardiovascular disease risk factors, uh, very, very significant. So Sprint Mind Study, um, looking at, again, the modifiable risk factors, physical activity, diet, and cognitive and social stimulation, very significant and important, and so the U.S. Pointer Study is currently taking place in five um, U.S. cities. It did have to be on pause for a significant amount of time due to COVID, but it's following individuals with a self-guided as well as a structured um, lifestyle plan, um, working with individuals with, uh, who are involved in uh, YMCAs. Houston in Texas is actually one of the sites for the U.S. Pointer Study, and it is, is very much looking at um, lifestyle intervention. Like with heart disease, could this be an area where not only do medications have um, benefits, but also modifiable um, lifestyle factors as well? Not only is that study being happened, uh, U.S. Pointer study in the United States, but this just kind of shows across the world. Um, it's called the Finger Study in uh, across the world, and this is just a map that kind of shows all the other places who are doing a very similar study to this. Changing the trajectory, the when we look at particularly when we talk about Adjuhel being being um, the latest to be approved first time in over 18 years, um, delaying the onset. If we developed a treatment by 2025, which that's right around the corner, that would delay the onset of Alzheimer's by just five years, that would change the trajectory for 5.7 million people who were, would have been expected to develop Alzheimer's disease by 2050 by not having it. So again, there are so many areas that are being studied and we know the importance of why this is so urgent right now because we can have such an impact on the future. All of the information that I very, very quickly went over today, you can find it on our Science Hub. So you can download it on your phone, um, you can, everything, every study I've talked about today, all of our facts and figures, all the latest on, on Adjuhelm, everything is in um, the Science Hub. So if you want any of this information, please check that out. And the great thing about Science Hub is for those of us who are not researchers, and some of this is very extremely technical, Science Hub is, is really for, for everyone. It's for all of us. So I just want to wrap up and, and just reiterate that, again, the Alzheimer's Association 
is the global leader in Alzheimer's and, design and dementia science and research. This is a very exciting time for research, more so than ever. New tools for being able to detect and get an accurate diagnosis, growing diversity of therapies, and then new resources to promote diverse participation, which you will hear about um, later today. Most significantly that there is more hope than ever. And um, right there at the top right is our 24-hour helpline. Our helpline is staffed all the time, uh, every language. Um, you can call if you've got a question, if you, if you need tips, if you need help, if you have an emergency, if it's not an emergency and you just need to talk to someone about what is happening and how to get some help, you can always, always reach someone on our, on our helpline. That was really fast, Maxine. I, I, <laughs> I'll leave that up for a minute. Thank you, Jenny. I'm going to open up for any questions. Does anybody have any questions for Jenny? So the question is, is there any local research? Great that you asked that because Dr. Maestro will be here to present on that same matter. They're opening up a new site for research in Alzheimer's and, um, and care. So she can, can uh, speak to that um, when she presents. Any other questions? The answer is yes, which is, I mean, amen. Yes. And then the, the closest other side that would have research open or available would be the San Antonio area. But if you sign up to trial match, they can always match you to the closest research based on, on your profile. And you can take advantage of that for sure. Any other questions? Good morning, Chelsea. Hi, um, I don't have a question. Um, I just wanted to jump on because um, I did put something in the chat. So hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Chelsea Renhill, and I'm the public policy coordinator for the Alzheimer's Association. And so in the chat, I dropped uh, one of my favorite things, which is our phone to action link. And I dropped it right after Jenny uh, spoke about the progress we've made with research funding uh, at the federal level. And so if you would like to take action, I promise you it takes about a minute to do so. Um, you click the link, it, you put in your information and it'll send a quick email to your member of Congress to let them know that we're asking for additional funding this year at the National Institutes of Health. And this is really helpful for us because when we're engaging with offices, they're letting us know that they're hearing from folks out in the community. And so it's a quick way to take action. Um, I like to say it's like instant gratification. You feel good about it afterwards. And so I, I encourage you all to take action um, in this quick way and it will definitely help us make a difference. Thank you. Thanks, Chelsea. I, that's one of my favorite slides and I know I went through it really quick, but when you look at where in a very short amount of time from grassroots advocacy, from people hearing from all, from our elected officials hearing from us saying, You've got to invest more in this disease, these diseases. So thanks for putting that in there. And oh, commonly asked question. Let's say you attended a walk in the past and you signed up to be an advocate. Sign up, do it again, right? I mean, you can never do it enough. Yes, we're always looking to grow our, our advocacy program. And so if you're interested in getting involved, I'll drop uh, my information in the chat feature. You can reach out to me via email or phone call, uh, and we can schedule some time offline to, to connect and see what your interests are and how you'd like to engage with your elected official. Thank you. So our next speaker is going to be uh, city, the city of Brownsville uh, to present the city proclamation for World Alzheimer's Day. And as a Rose Timmerman mentioned earlier in the program, it's today is the day in which we bring awareness to the disease, obviously, right? We want to make sure that we get past the stigma in regards to this disease, that we talk about it very frankly, that we find the resources for our families, especially in the Hispanic community. That's where we have the most challenges in reaching those resources. So please take advantage of the resources that are available inside. Make sure that we um, continue to call the 800 number if you need any help and that you find another fellow, you know, person here in the room that also has been through the disease, either as a caregiver or currently living with it and, and learn from that. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here and um, thank you for joining us. 
My name is Meredith Golanski, and for those of you who don't know me, I represent the Southwest area. And I'm very happy to be involved with this group. Uh, we've been working now for a few months to, or to bring this, uh, this event for you. And we've had other events, I think, online before. It's an, it's an issue that really does affect our community more than we anticipate. And so hopefully more events like this will help us reduce the incidence of um, dementia or at least delay it um, because it does take a toll. So I'm here to present the proclamation as today is World Alzheimer's Day. <clears throat> as designating Tuesday, September 21st of 2021 as World Alzheimer's Day in the city of Brownsville. Whereas Alzheimer's disease, a progressive neurodegenerative brain disorder tragically robs individuals of their memories and leads to progressive mental and physical impairments. And whereas an estimated 6 million people in the United States are living with Alzheimer's, including 400,000 in Texas. And whereas Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of the death in the United States and the fifth leading cause among the elderly. And whereas according to the Alzheimer's Association's Facts and Figures report, the direct cost of caring for those with Alzheimer's to American society is valued at $355 billion. And more than 11 million caregivers provide 15.3 billion hours of unpaid care to those with Alzheimer's or other dementia. Furthermore, in Texas, nearly 1.1 million family members and friends care for people with Alzheimer's and other dementia, providing 1.8 billion hours of unpaid care with the annual value of this care giving totaling to $25.7 billion. And whereas in recognition of the individuals, families, friends, and caregivers dealing with Alzheimer's disease and the researchers who are seeking a cause or cure, and whereas the city of Brownsville recognizes the efforts of the Alzheimer's Association to raise funds and promote awareness to fight Alzheimer's and other dementia, thereby improving the quality of human life for those living with Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers. Now, therefore, we, the members of the city commission of the city of Brownsville, Texas, by virtue of the authority vested by the charter of said city, do hereby declare Tuesday, September 21st of 2021, as World Alzheimer's Day in the city of Brownsville, and we urge all residents to show their support by wearing purple and engaging in a day of activity, honoring the strength, passion, and the endurance of people facing Alzheimer's disease. Done on this, the 21st day of September, 2021. Thank you. And um, now we'll be Dr. Maya's day <laughs> to present more information. And, um, thank you. And if you can't wear purple today, we have a lot coming up and you can do your purple day that day. <laughs> and Dr. Maestro will follow up and talk about local research. And for those of you who may not know me, my name is Maxine Vieta. I'm the program manager for the Alzheimer's Association. I am local, I am here. So please don't forget to call. I'm always available for you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. So excited to be here and to see um, that our city, Brownsville is once more taking the lead in the valley. The first city in the valley to make a proclamation of Chamber of And I'm going to take a seat about the issues, some of the issues that Jeannie put out there, and some news that I think are good for the valley. Very good, I think. Um, I came here in 2016. I was hired by the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley to do research in Alzheimer's disease. That was my mission. And uh, it was an adventure, you know, to move here with my family. <laughs> Never been in this area of the country. And oh my God, it has been a blessing. In many ways. So we didn't know how, how much Alzheimer's there was in the area. In fact, people told me Mexicans don't get Alzheimer's. Yo dije que bueno. But then we start visiting, and people will pull me outside. outside. My I'm seeing something different in my husband. I think I have to, you know, talk like that. Y cuando 
I met with public officials. I remember this lunch in West Lago with some of them. Again, I said, where do people with Alzheimer's go? And he said, we don't have Alzheimer's. There is not enough to create services for people with Alzheimer's or caregivers. I thought, hmm, maybe it's true. And maybe we have found the source to prevent Alzheimer's. This was not the case. Why the disconnect? How many Alzheimer's? So I'm going to show you a few maps where you can see perhaps where you live, where you have lived, and you're going to see how many Alzheimer's cases we have in the body. But let me tell you just one thing. According to the Medicare fee for service, so the people that actually, you know, are in Medicare, the county in the nation that has more Alzheimer's disease is a Star County. Does that surprise you? Yes? Why? It's a rural area. Yeah, so air is pure. People are very isolated though. They have large families, but they are isolated. What are they suffering in that area? What do you think? It's a happy place? Has been always a happy place? Relaxed? What do you think? It would be, it should be, but it's not. Too militarized, too poor, lack of everything. The cities are lacking places to play, to walk, to meet, to experience art, culture. And I have the impression that even though everybody is very proud of their culture, the culture, I can only see it in the name of the restaurants, in the name of the business. So, almost like an identity crisis. Like you try to be to the standards, but feeling that inside the leader is an imposter. I don't know. So I did a study in this area, the whole valley. I found historical issues that may affect the um, incidence of Alzheimer's. So there are two concepts that I would like to, to explore with you. One is incidence and the other is prevalence. Very close. Incidents are new cases. New cases of Alzheimer's. And prevalence are the cases new and old. So you can, you can have a lot of cases in the community just because people with Alzheimer's live longer. So you would say we take care of our people at home as long as we can. So they are gonna live 20 years with Alzheimer's. So they are gonna be counted as more. But is it if people die very soon, there's going to be maybe low prevalence with high incidence. So if the timer is very bad or is poorly treated, then people are going to, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we don't know. What is it? There are more cases of Alzheimer's? Or people live longer, or maybe both. The ones that said so we are studying this. We want to find. We are going to find out. But the first one, you, not the first one. Alzheimer's oh, disease, of course, is a disease in the brain, yes, but not only in the brain. Not only in the brain. 
our whole arteries and microcirculation, our own eyes, our, imagine people with glaucoma or high pressure in the eye are at higher risk of Alzheimer's. Do you know anybody like that? People with diabetes have damage in the membranes that separate the blood. So blood gets into the brain and the blood damage the brain. Do you know people like that with diabetes? Do you know people that may have the heart big? Because even though they take their blood pressure medication, they still, when they get upset, get their blood pressure very high, or they drink, or put some salt, and then the blood pressure goes high. Do you know any of them? Do you think you are lucky to know any of those few people in the body? No, we have them at home. And maybe one of us is one of us. Maybe it's your spouse. Or sadly, might be one of your kids. So it's no surprise. How do you think, how do you exercise here? You know, do you do Tai Chi, yoga, walk by the flowers? Uh, you know, you have some senior teams playing, running in this weather. Imagine this without a senior center where you can do these things. Imagine this in a star county. This, the, the first blue, you don't need to, you know, I mean, probably you are familiar with this. There are uh, the four counties now we are including in Zapata because what they did with the Falcon Dam and the people that was relocated, it was off. And this is now emerging as an Alzheimer's disease. They were relocated. They saw their houses, they saw their church bombarded, dynamite. They were not even compensated. Right? How do you feel about safety in your home if this happened to you when you were a kid, when you were a teenager? So this is what we are identifying. It's not only, it's not only the genetics that is in the blood. It's the genetic of the society. See, you can inherit things not by the blood, like money or your last name. It's society, our culture. This has happened to them in when they build the fight. Okay, so that, that's why now I'm including Sabak. So what you see in the very light blue, these are people, beneficiaries, over beneficiaries, um, over 65, the social security. And there are more people in the darkest the blue. So you see, perhaps in the area of the, of the island, perhaps in the area of Harlingen, perhaps in McAllen. How do you see Brownsville? How do you see Brownsville? people having access to Medicare. One of the few places in the back. How do you think that impact health? Having to think if I go to a doctor, if I cross the bridge to go to a doctor, I'm gonna have to pay for medication. Maybe I just hold up. Maybe I just ask my sister what she's taking for the blood pressure. Would I go for memory problems if I don't have insurance? And if your daughter is paying for everything and your daughter is, you know, already, you don't want to be somebody just, oh, I have a memory. So all oh, these are the realities, huh? So look at Brown's. But in the green, you see how many people are there over 65. And how do you see Brownsville? The Brownsville area? Lots. Lots. So we have lots of people, but very few in Medicare, too few. And next, uh, Rosa, please. So this is, how do you think this is, this is 
social justice, social justice? Is it justifiable? For how long are we going to keep silent about this? What can we do? And all the for-profit hospitals in the world. So that's what we are trying to implement at the Alzheimer's Center. You know what goes into the diagnosis of Alzheimer's? You need the images of the brain. You know how much an MRI is? If you don't have insurance, it's about, if you don't have insurance, a regular MRI without borders is about $600. And if you have insurance, the copayment is between 100 and 200. And then, if there is something funny there, I don't know. <laughs> I think you're pressing <laughs> So, but I don't know. If you have to pay for, for that, how would you pay for it? Okay, then imagine that they say, okay, too bad, you have too much amyloid. You know, you might need a CSF. So, to take some liquid from your, you know, to make sure you don't have a virus that is going on on your brain. Uh, don't worry, that's only going to cost, you know, 300 plus 400 for the physician. Yes. So we hire the physicians to do that. But, but who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for all this? Oh, and then if the person is such, has such a bad luck that after all the investments say, you know, for you, too much amyloid, you are going to develop Alzheimer's disease. But we have a treatment, a new treatment, approved by the FDA. It's only $56,000 per year. Don't worry. What do you think about this? How do you think this will benefit the body? How do you think this will benefit the city of Brownsville? How do you think? How do you think I feel like with the help of many people, including Alzheimer's Association, uh, Rosa, and many advocates, NIH, so the National Institute of Aging, puts out calls to say, you know, we are gonna fund this project, why this project is important. I went to the to the House of Representatives to talk about the value and Alzheimer's. And now, okay, let me see. Okay, thanks. Oh, oh, but then I have to, I have to show. I, I tell you that story. But um, you see this? This is how many Alzheimer's patients are in the body. The brown has the highest number. So one between around two thousand patients in that brown, darkest brown. Where do you live? Where do you live? Where your kids live? And it's actually for the cases if there are six No, no, these are Medicare. These oh, are people that already, uh, you know, by the doctor say, you know, these people have Alzheimer's disease. Oh, I mean, sir, this. This is crude. This is the number of people, not the percentage. It's flat. This isn't even this thing close. We don't have many Medicare patients in percentage. Exactly. So you don't even have those people. That is more. What happened if you had all the people in all the adults in Brownsville in Medicare pay? What do you think? How many we will have? But you know, then how long? The Star County has the highest number proportion, proportion of people with Alzheimer's. They have 23%. Just a question in the end of chat asking if the number of incidents in front of the higher population or just because it's more vaccinated? No, it's not because the number of people. So we have proportionally more cases. Like if you look at Matalum, has more population, higher population, but proportionally they have less. 
Now let me tell you, maybe maybe you can help me because I'm like a detective. So in Star County, for some reason, more than 90% of people is on Medicaid. When I ask the doctors, how come? I say, they say, 20 years ago, it was very easy to stay, to be in Medicaid. We have a lot of flexibility in this area. So I don't know what's happening here. When I took the, the same, so I started to look at environmental factors, for example. Because I, I believe the health of the river reflects the health of the people. We cannot, even though we live like if we don't have the river nearby. We live by the river. So I believe that environmental toxins are playing something here. And you know what? The map of Brunswick is identical to the map. The, the map of Alzheimer's is identical to the map of lead. How many of the houses in Southmost still have lead painting? How many backyards? How many ceilings? So I want to study this. This cannot be done in San Antonio. This needs to be done here. So that's part of where you know, we are looking. Probably a lot of people have died with Alzheimer's and we don't know. So now you tell me, okay, tell me something good, please. <laughs> <laughs> tell me something good. Okay. So I think that um, we, we need to look at how we live in many ways. Um, how we move, you know, how much music we hear and we sing, how much touch we give and receive. It could be a pet, you know, <laughs> but we need to touch. Do you know that your tongue has like can only perceive six flavors, nothing more. And when you swallow, when you swallow, then the little molecules from the food that you chew come to the nose from the very back. And that then you can sense one meaning also. But when you are looking at the TV or very fast, and you don't pay attention, you don't even stimulate that area of your brain. And when we are too busy now, then it's not good for the brain. So I think that one good thing is that we can talk about it and, we, and that we have a lot of resources in the city. And it's unbelievable with healthy Browns what it has been doing to, to steer the, you know, <laughs> all this. And, but, but we need, of course, much more, but we need, the first thing that we need to change is here. You know, not saying not me, oh, I do enough. It's never enough because this is the series. And we don't know, you know, where, when. So um, the, this place in Harlingen, the uh, Institute of Neuroscience, will be the home of Alzheimer's Center. Hopefully, we'll find a space also in Brunswick, and Rose know we'll fight. We, we have been fighting for having a place in downtown Brunswick, where everybody can walk in, go to the doctor, but also go to OT, go to uh, the library, go to do some yoga or singing, or so whatever, have a dating, you know, night or something. So all but we haven't been able to do that in Brownsville. We did it first in Harlingen just because the city gave this, we you know, raised the money basically to do that. So the building will be inaugurated for the public, for the patients in November two or three. And we are gonna be uh, assessing for free everything 
for at least 150 people over 50 that want to know the real state of the memory and want to know what are the risks for Alzheimer's. No migratory status, nothing. It's going to be 150. I hope that with those 150, I can raise more money. They said to me, still, they're not going to come. Nobody wants to know. And I said, wait. <laughs> they don't know enough about Alzheimer's. You know, they want to go to diabetes. They don't want to know about Alzheimer's. And say, okay, wait. So with 150, hopefully we can raise. And we are applying for to bring the US pointer here, so the trials, and we are applying to, to bring other clinical trials. Um, I have said no to this $56,000 medication. What will happen? Now I'm changing my mind. I said, maybe if we show the medication work, I don't know if it's going to work because they didn't test it in Hispanics. Okay? They didn't test it in Hispanics. Why? Because Hispanics cannot buy the medication. Why do you want to test in Hispanics? Everybody know that they are they have lower income than, than whites. I'm not talking about Jack. <laughs> so they didn't test it in Hispanics. So just because of that, I'm going to say to the company, if you pay for everything. And on top of that, you compensate very well the participants. I can bring it to the world. We don't know if, they, if it's going to be bad for the person. So I, I really want them to test in Hispanics, in other places, in Florida, in New York, where they have a lot of resources, rich people, they want to go. And so in the legislature would be nice if they test them. And we'll see what happens. And they don't bring it here. But we are talking to the company. And, and let me tell you, yes. No. Yes. We expect to see if the environment, for example, of Brownsville, in terms of you know, these environmental issues affect the same. And how are you recruiting participants? We haven't started yet. <laughs> because I want to see the building, you know, every month they say, okay, you know, next month or whatever. But since like, they've been telling us, but in November, and we hire people. We hire neurologists, psychiatrists, neuropsychologists. And we are, we are still looking for four project coordinators and one recruiter. So, of course, I would like the, the senior coalition and the organizations to have a priority because we've been working on that for so long that I want everybody, you know, that is active to, if they want. And also they can participate. Like I have people say, okay, I, I'll participate. I don't tell me anything. <laughs> Okay, okay, but you know, and also our hope we are working really working on um, uh, a small book that's gonna be in digital and in print. Uh, hopefully, we're gonna test it with uh, the partnership with uh, Healthy Brownsville and uh, to spread for free. In the, in the city. So it's about prevention, just about prevention. Prevention. 40% of the cases could be prevented if we behave well. But the city needs to improve. So it's easier for us to do exercise and to have, you know, blood pressure control and all that. So I guess that's it. That's the good news.
It's good, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I gave you That's an <laughs> The only criteria will be they are willing to complete the imaging. They don't need to give the spinal fluid unless they, you know, they, they, they want. But the imaging, so, and the imaging implies that they will need to go under the magnet. Uh, the magnet, like some people that have uh, peacemaker will not be good for them, but maybe we can do a other type of imaging. We're thinking about that. Um, and not a very serious. I mean, we are planning a study for Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's, but we want to focus first on, on Alzheimer's. So initially we're going to wait for the people with Parkinson's or other this neurological disease that might, you know, confuse things. Or people that underwent uh, brain cancer. This is another topic we wanna, you know, we notice there are a lot of people with brain cancer in the area. Uh, so, uh, but particularly younger people. Please. Cancer is always here. Oh, very important. Very, very important. One of the things I asked to the Valley Baptist uh, uh, Legacy Foundation was I would mm -hmm. like to include the, the, the chaplain program, chaplaincy program they have because we need to support uh, the person with Alzheimer's. We also need to support, you know, I hate when people say, oh, the disease from their identity. I don't think that's true. I believe the soul is eternal. And I believe the soul, you can see it when you have a baby, it doesn't know even who he is, and you already know who this little person is. I don't care if I have a person that's not open their eyes. Still, there is a soul there. Not that I want to be, you know, pro anything. No, I, I'm just saying. So I think we need to take care of that soul and uh, the feelings, and we already have one program, right, Rosa, that we are recruiting to support caregivers. That's also for free, and they get some compensation. Yeah. So they get some advice. I mean, this is like when you have a kid, you don't know anything about it, and you learn from other mothers, but with a disease like Alzheimer's, you don't even know who to ask. Yeah. And people judge you, yeah. you know, like, and even your own family, you're not treating mom right. You know, and, and, and you just want her to be dead so you can be on your own. So we are providing currently, um, you know, training, training. And I want to do a school for caregivers also, you know, where people can know if I cannot do it this month, I know it's going to be, you know, two months and I'm going to prepare myself to. You know, usually people say, oh, I'm going to tell my daughter. Okay. That's very important. Um, and, and in Brownsville, which is the largest population city, um, we do not have a senior center. We have a lot of daycares, but we don't have a Brownsville senior center where you all can go like this morning and learn or play or do cards or knitting or things like that. You don't especially need somebody to walk you to the door, get you out of bed and put you in a chair. You can get there by yourself if you want to at your own time, at your own pace. And, and, and we, we are striving to do that here in Brownsville. It's been hard, it's been hard. One of the biggest problems we had is finding a building. We thought we had one, what was it, four or five years ago? Three, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it didn't work. So talk to your city commissioners, talk to your neighbors about we don't have a daycare. Oh, what? I forgot where an architect is going to come and advise about the bathroom. Okay. How to make the bathroom exciting. <laughs> relaxing like people can feel uh, floating 
And we're going to have, we're going to remake three bathrooms, three with using different techniques. An architect will come and will buy the things, will talk. And we're going to need three different bathrooms to, to see how, and we're going to make sure people with different backgrounds to see how much relax. And there is something called, you know, these beautiful paintings on the uh, Renaissance, um, Renacimiento, that have, you know, a lot of naked people. Yeah. <laughs> oh, beautiful. You know, uh, we want to test. You know, the effect of these things in, in, you know, how you feel. You put them in the bedroom, what happened? You know, you put them in the bathroom, what happened? You know, so we're going to be testing, and we have the, the students that are leading these projects here are the students from occupational therapy. So, but we are helping them to develop not only safer place, like bathroom that look like hospital. But a bathroom that looked like a spa. Since, you know, so we are we started to run the traps. So that's and Amanda is a student graduated from counseling. She did her masters and her bachelor's, and she's the one running the university. And also she started testing in West Laco, an area of eight hundred homes. Where 70% of them have older adults. And the income is $29,000. So we are going to be visiting this area. <laughs> Whatever we find that is nice is our testing area. We are going to bring it Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. It wasn't <laughs> I'm from Brownsville. I'm a graduate of Texas Southwest College. I graduated with an associate's degree in nursing. Uh, married my husband in 72. He was in the military. We moved around. And uh, anyway, so we, I worked in Louisiana, worked in Houston. We moved there. He retired when he was 40. And around that time, I started noticing some changes. He wasn't talking much. Uh, he was taken up without telling me. There was a lot of behavioral issues. And what I thought was, okay, this man wants a divorce. <laughs> you know, but anyway, yeah, you know, I, I mean, he wouldn't talk to me, whatever. I was working in, an, in the ER at Memorial City, hospital uh, in Houston. So 12 hour shifts, uh, raising two kids, and then coming to home to somebody that wouldn't talk to me. So anyway, he's more behavioral issues, uh, financial, um, you know, like I said, taken off. Anyway, so I filed for divorce. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I didn't know what to do. I tried everything. And then on my way home from work, I was involved in a car accident, really bad one there on I-10. So I was pretty sick and then I couldn't work. Anyway, so the divorce process stopped. And um, my husband at that time was working for Homeland Security. So he was, my husband was very meticulous, uh, played golf, tennis, didn't smoke, didn't do drugs. And, you know, um, so anyway, he was very active in that. It's almost like we had separate lives. Um, but there was more behavioral issues that I, I became very concerned because he would take off. We would be driving, he'd pull over, get out of the car and take off. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this man's gonna get killed. So because he was a veteran, he went to the VA. And I would go with him sometimes to the appointments and how are you doing, Mr. Lopez? I'm fine, he would say. And they'd ask him these questions. He was adding by seven, all these tests that they do. And I finally wrote all the list of the behavioral issues and I gave it to the counselor. And is that true, Mr. Lopez? And he goes, yeah, but still nothing was done. So anyway, so he started 
taking money out of the bank and um, putting it in foil. You know, some of the signs. I'm just sharing a little bit with you. Uh, and then uh, at one point he did scare me. I thought he was going to hit me. But and at that point I said, okay, now I am going to divorce him. But when I knew that I knew, and there was some more symptoms, like I said, I wish I'd have brought them all down, but I can't think of all of them right now. But when I knew that I knew that something was definitely wrong is he was seeing people and they weren't there. And, and when I'll share one of the stories, he says, you know, our grandkids are Malia and Josiah. He says, he would call me Jane. He said, Jane, they're watching TV with me. And then I blink and they're gone. And I'm like, oh my God, this is really, really serious. Anyway, he was diagnosed with young onset dementia, uh, frontal temporal lobe with Lewy bodies. And it just seems like all of a sudden he couldn't talk, he would get lost just so much. And it's like, if you've ever been in a tornado and you know, you can't get out of it. That's how my life has been for, let's see, he was around 58. He's 71. He's in the nursing home. We moved from the Houston area to the Valley in 2013 because my mom got sick. And uh, the only nursing home they could put him in was in Harlingen. And it was not an Alzheimer's unit. And you can only imagine my husband's young, strong, but try to get out. And so backtracking a little bit, when he was first diagnosed, I called the Alzheimer's Association and I shared my story and I was like, wow, you know, how did I miss all that? And I'm not ashamed to tell you, you know, I'm nursing, you know, ER critical care, but I was blindsided by this disease. And uh, so anyway, through the Alzheimer's Association, I, I uh, belong to a caregiver support group in Houston that helped me a lot. Oh my gosh, we shared our stories, we helped each other. And uh, I've been to Austin as an advocate. I've been to Washington, DC uh, to advocate, get more funding. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, my husband now, like I said, he's a tracher, he's, you know, he's, he's very sick. Um, he went into the hospital but <clears throat> during COVID a year and a half ago. And, you know, I thought he was dying, but somehow he's just not ready to go. That's what the doctor says. He's not letting go. He's not ready to go. And um, so tube feeding. And it is tough to see somebody that can't swallow, you know, chokes on his saliva. And, uh, you know, all the things that you have to do prevention so that he doesn't get bed sores and other things. Um, so somebody was saying here, we do have a senior center, uh, in Harlingen through all these years, I lost myself. If you would have seen me a year ago, you would have said it's a different person. I think a lot of way I was very sick. I kept going to the doctor and they couldn't find out what was wrong with me. I couldn't even tell what was wrong. You know, I had a pain here. I thought I had a blood clot. I thought, I, you know, all these things. And it was just stress. I mean, it's like, you know, but, you know, you, you just hurt. So finally, um, I joined a senior center. Uh, I met a lot of nice ladies. I do line dancing, um, Zumba, you know. And so, yeah, isolation was real bad. But anyway, I hope I shared a little bit about my story. And I'm looking forward to the support that you guys are talking about. Um, and just thank you for being more involved with the All Star Association. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know it's hard. It's hard. I don't know. Yes, I can see it in your eyes. You want to talk? But yes. And you do look very well. But as a caregiver, when it's first coming, you think of everything. Oh, he's seen another woman. Well, why is he getting rid of the money? Yeah. Uh, and has no idea that he took money out of the bank or where he put. I have a husband who's 12 years older than I am. And he's getting on to that point. He no longer carries his credit cards because he's lost them. I gave him a renewal, a, a, re, uh, a replacement of our credit card. Across the couch, he took it. Half an hour later, he said, where's my credit card? I said, I gave it to you. 
first and we went through the whole, I knew it wasn't any, at Walmart or anything. He threw it in the trash. I said, okay, you don't get a credit card. <laughs> but those kinds of things happen. And uh, the food is different. Um, they're different people and you kind of, you learn not to fight them, just to agree with them. You know, uh, we traveled all over the world when we were younger, we didn't have children. And he'll sit there and watch TV and he says, boy, I hope I get to Florence one day. Honey, we were there for about six months. Oh, or the Arches National, National Park. We were there three summers ago, you know, and he doesn't remember any of that. But he remembers who his first grade teacher was. Bye, damn. But anyway, let me, I want to introduce a very special lady to me. Her name is Lendy. And she has been a supporter of healthy communities and me for a long time. She likes to talk. And she always said, you know me, Rose, I can talk. <laughs> yeah, trying to keep her quiet is something else. But she is a tremendous person when it comes to caregivers. She will sit with you. She will have a class. She, she conducts classes. And I have to tell you all, if anything that this workshop did for me today was to know that we need a support group somewhere, somehow we need to start a support group and have people talk about what's going on to make sure that they're catching those signs or are avoiding them like I was for a long time. But we also need to know about our caregivers. It took me a long time to realize that I was sick too, not just my husband. I was sick, but I would put it off, put it off, put it off. But I'll let, let, let me talk to you. And we have, we have an extra half hour in the building, so thank you. Maxine said 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. I think I need the microphone. Oh, four. Okay, great. So um, I was not prepared, but like Rose said, give me five minutes and I'll take 25. <laughs> um, because I do have uh, working for the Wellman Journal Foundation and working with family caregivers and uh, caregivers, you know, of those with Alzheimer's has been a passion of mine for many years. This was not my world um, 18 years ago. But the moment that I stepped into nonprofit, the moment that I stepped into dealing with families with Alzheimer's, it changed me and it changed me for the best because now I'm also, you know, it also prepared me to be a caregiver to my parents. I'm Leti Sanchez. I'm the regional manager for the WellMed Charitable Foundation, not the clinical part, it's a full disclosure. I work for the foundation. And what we do through the WellMed Charitable Foundation, we do have senior centers. Uh, so we do have the Harlington Senior Center, a huge, magnificent place for uh, older adults to come and exercise. We have one in McAllen as well. And I hope, I really, really hope that we can get one here in Brownsville. In many conversations with Rose, I've said we have uh, the possibility to partner, but we desperately need the location. And I do not know Brownsville, not from here. Uh, but I'm very happy, though, that now we have someone from Brownsville that is going to be my right-hand person working here in Brownsville. Her name is Dory Moody, which has been working with us for uh, about a month now. Um, but again, you know, we definitely feel that the seniors here would make a huge difference for the aging population, for the older adults. Um, the other program that we have is a caregiver program. Caregiver SOS is our, is our program. And what we do is that we provide education support in that journey for the family caregivers. We work with all types of caregivers. So they do not have to be only the Alzheimer's, uh, the uh, caregivers to Alzheimer's, uh, you know, persons with Alzheimer's, any type of caregiving, because I'm sure all of you agree that caring for somebody with diabetes, somebody caring for somebody that might have, like my father, you know, um, heart disease, is challenging. I'm here to tell you that it breaks my heart when the doctor says your dad now has 15% capacity on his heart, I know what I'm going to be facing sooner than later. But, you know, many years ago, I was the editor for a small newspaper, and I was uh, interviewing a psychiatrist from, from McKellen. And my interview back then was about Alzheimer's. And what he said was Alzheimer's destroys 
the brain cells of the person, but it also affects the heart of the family members next to that person. And that is so true. We work, you know, I, I'm so happy to see and, and, you know, to know everything about the Alzheimer's Association because I believe in hope. There has to be something out there for my children and for my grandchildren. So I'm hoping for that. And I'm so happy and I hear that all the statistics and the information that Dr. Maestro has presented to me and to all of us here. And you know what? Last year, through our program, we reached close to 600 um, caregivers. But that is only a fraction. That is nothing. Look at the numbers that we have. Uh, we serve Hidalgo, Willisie, and Cameron County. We're not in, in Star County because we do not have a grant to cover Star County. But with all the demographics given to us, it tells me that we should be working every single corner of the valley looking for all these families with Alzheimer's. Because the family caregivers sometimes feel that we don't have enough education. We do not know how I'm gonna work. What is it? Number one is, wh why are you telling me that I'm a caregiver? I'm not, I'm the spouse, I'm the daughter. Yeah, I'm the, the daughter-in-law, I'm not the caregiver. So first we need to educate our community and to say and identify and say, I am a family caregiver. Many times, you know, they still feel that it's a paid provider and it's not, okay? After we uh, identify the caregivers, you know, through our program, Caregiver SOS, we have different programs. So first we connect. We have three family uh, caregiver specialists. We have one in McAllen full-time, one just newly hired in Harlingen. She's inside the Harlingen Senior Center and now Doherty here in Harlingen, in Brownsville. And the, family, the caregiver specialists, what they do is they connect with the caregivers and they identify their needs. We do, uh, we work with the T-Care uh, program, which is a T-Care um, program to, it's a nine step where we identify the stress levels of the caregiver. What are your stressors? And, and once we do that, then we have steps to work with them. How can we help you identify different things that you might be going through? Guilt, maybe. Fear, fear of the unknown. Fear of not being able to change the outcome. So we work uh, using uh, that uh, caregiver coaching program, but we do have a certain uh, signature programs, which is if you see the brains and we have some brains out there in our little table, we have the stress busting program uh, for family caregivers. We have two tracks because again, we work with any type of caregivers, but in particular to those uh, families that have a loved one with Alzheimer's, we have this evidence-based program where we teach a family caregivers different things about Alzheimer's, the progression, the different, the challenging behaviors, because I cannot tell you how many times the caregivers come to us and they say, um, I had a, a caregiver, I was flying somewhere and when I got to the airport, there was a lot of missed calls and assignment from this caregiver. So I called her back and her story was, she was crying and crying and she says, you cannot believe what happened to me. My husband just kicked me out of the bedroom and he told my wife, take this ugly fat woman out of my room because your mom is gonna find her here, just gonna get upset. So definitely, you know, he was working on that long-term memory and the caregiver was crying because she says, Lindy, my husband, doesn't recognize me anymore. She's thinking of me 40 years earlier. And that is very difficult. And of course, you know, the more they know about the stages, the more that they know not to, no, don't take things personal. Uh, but there's also a lot of just things that honestly, we were not ready. We, nobody trained us to, for instance, um, uh, another very, very close friend of mine, uh, I was with my girls in San Antonio through a river walk and he calls me, he says, Mrs. G, the provider left. My mother is dirty. She smells horrible and I do not know what to do. Now, my friend at that time, he was probably in his early fifties. And I said, what do you mean? You don't know what to do, Gabriel. You know what you need to do. And he says, I can't. There's no way I can 
She needs to die for my mom. There's no way I can see her. I can address her. I can't. And I said, Gabriel, at this time, your mother needs you. And at this point in time, you need to change a diaper. And he said, stay with me on the phone. And he cried. Because he had never, he never thought that he was, you know, that he was going to be in a place to change the diapers of his mom. Family caregiving either brings the family together, but many times it can also, you know, pull the, the family apart. We have worked with a lot of caregivers during the year, and the caregiver specialists, what they do is they connect with the, with the caregivers. They go through the journey, a journey that can be three months or three years or more. But we also, again, through the stress busting program, we help them understand the nature of Alzheimer's, um, uh, identify their stress levels, and then give them some tools so they can practice at home when they're stressed out. And they go from the breathing, through the meditation, through our, our therapy, journaling, those type of things. And the whole idea is to help the caregiver finish that journey, but finish the journey well, uh, we have had a lot of caregivers through the years also that end up in the hospital. And unfortunately, we also have some caregivers that actually pass away before their loved one because caregiving can kill you. And that is basically what we do through the caregiver program. So again, Dorisela, Dori Moody, she's here. We do not have an office. And that's going to be, um, uh, Rose, another thing that we need to work here. Looking for, we need a place for Dori to connect with the caregivers. Uh, this year, under our funding, we are funded in part by the Area Agency on Aging. And this year, you know, aside from doing all this individual coaching with the caregivers, we're going to focus a lot more on the support groups. Our challenges are very unique. And that's the reason that we need to also kind of pull together our own resources and figure out what are we going to do for these caregivers. What are we going to do to work together? And again, you know, we're going to focus on support groups. Uh, you know, we're looking into which type of support groups can be most beneficial because the other thing is that it's hard to get, you know, uh, a, a lot of people to come to educational programs. Uh, Dory is going to be here in Brownsville. We have a little table if you want to talk to, uh, to us. If you have uh, any caregivers that need to just connect and that might need somebody to talk to them for an hour, we have them. We, uh, as far as brain health, I, we have two initiatives. We have the brain health initiative. We're working with some doctors when they do this mini mental testing, you know, a lot of times, you know, after they get the mini mental, they say, okay, you have early onset, then what do you do? So one of the initiatives that we're working with some doctors is, if the mini mental says that the person does not show symptoms of cognitive decline, they're going to be referred to a senior center. Okay, so th that's the thing. You know, either refer them to the senior center. If they have cognitive decline, then refer them to the caregiver program. Um, in the senior centers, we have a program called Brain Savers. And Brain Savers program is evidence-based, and basically it puts together the importance of nutrition, you know, uh, the Alzheimer's Association had a program, and I, I don't know if they still have it, but, you know, I do remember, you are what you eat. You know, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So nutrition is really important. Sleep is another one. And caregivers sometimes don't have the luxury of a good sleep. So, you know, sleep is really important. Social connectivity. Dr. Maestro talked about that as well. You know, isolation is a very clear word uh, door to depression. So, you know, the Brain Savers programs puts together sleep, nutrition, social connectivity, physical exercise, um, and, and those type of programs are offered at the senior centers, um, and that might be a very good way also to, to help the community, and just making them aware that there's programs to help their physical body, but also their, their brain health. So thank you. Thank you, Rose. <laughs> We need to get together more and more as a group and voice our concerns, opinions, or ideas about what we need to do with somebody who has Alzheimer's. I know diabetes people have support groups, um, cancer people have support groups. And we used uh, Valley Regional, I think, had uh, 
Alzheimer's support group. And of course, all that has stopped because of COVID. So we need to find another place. This is a beautiful place. This, this cost you three thousand dollars a day to, to build. But you know, I begged the city to give it to me, so they did. But uh, I can do a lot of it. <laughs> but anyway, you saw, yes, ma'am. And I'm just here to tell you that I come from Abilene. Um, and I ran the senior center there for 13 years. Um, if you ever get a chance to Google city of Abilene, you'll see that they have a very impressive and beautiful uh, senior center. My goal for the city of Brownsville is to duplicate that. Um, I would, yeah. So I, you know, I can't sit back there any longer. <laughs> I, I'm planning a senior, well, and I'm not even calling it senior, and I'm not calling it um, daycare because we're we're not at that level, right? We're retired and active. So that's what I'm targeting is the retired and active community, which we have a very large community. I'm uh, not too far from that community. So I'm 55 and older, and so I've got less than one month ago. <laughs> but I have a, a very strong heart for um, that population and that community. Um, there's a lot that can be done that we can do. I know that this building that they're talking about, <clears throat> there have been some problems with construction. So I'm going to go forward with programming even though the building's not there. So November 12th, I'll have my first uh, um, active and retired uh, activity, which will be a senior sock hop, not even a senior, a retired and active sock hop, okay? With live music and costume contest and just something fun, right? Because music gets the body going, right? It keeps us from getting stiff and moving around. It keeps our brains moving. So that's my goal. Um, and so that's going to be kind of like our first like kickoff event is, you know, let's just get together. Let's see what we can do. And then from, you know, move forward and have more activities on a, on a regular basis. There's also at the um, downtown rec center, a free, what we call cardio dance class. And it's from eight 30 to nine 30. So there are some things going on. Okay. For, um, the, the retired and active population. We just got to get the word out and just let you know that it is on the horizon. We are um, working towards that. We're a little behind on the, on the game, but, but it's my goal to make sure that we, we get there. So um, I have actually two locations. I, I office out of uh, the Gonzalez Urban Center, but I also run the Downtown Recreation Center which is on 1338 East 8th Street. Uh, it's right across from the Linear Park and it has this big mural, colorful mural and there's a, but it's a, a beautiful facility. There's, we have two facilities for our after school care and there's nothing going on um, from, you know, eight in the morning till, you know, the kids get there at three. So my goal is to maybe, have some activities between eight and one so that we can, you know, get together. Right. Right. So one thing that I do know the Brownsville city of Brownsville has, they have empty gyms, gyms at Gonzalez, uh, at the rec center, uh, Oliveda probably. Mm -hmm. They have empty gyms from eight, but staffed. Okay, there's people there from eight o'clock to when kids come for after school products. Right. So yeah. the rec really has staffing there. Yeah. Gonzalez, there's not anyone there because, like, I'm out and about. So if I know that we're going to have an activity or an event there, then I can be there. But for sure, there's things going on. There's things we can do. I want to do sewing classes. I want to do dance classes. I want to do karaoke. I want to do cooking classes. You know, I basically want to do what you want to do. So you tell me what you're interested in doing and we're going to do it. 
That's that's how I work. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. If I may add something. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you for coming today, Lily, Leslie. Thanks for speaking, Jamie. Um, everybody. I just wanted to just to, to mention once again the Alzheimer's Association is really has a commitment to make sure that we make the resources available not just to the Rio Grande Valley, but across these, the communities that we serve. Um, making sure that we have support groups, that we recruit volunteers in order to help us deliver that message to having a greater access to the community. What is changing is that we're also being more involved with the individuals that are getting diagnosed a lot younger in the disease process. They're actually in the early stages. So we have early stages engagement programs. And that is one of my goals to have something here in the community available to everyone as well. You know, one of the things that we did face during COVID at the top of the, the pandemic is that while we were very successful in reaching a new demographic, a new population because they had access to the resources to connect, we also had the challenge that we lost those individuals that do not connect to the internet, right? So as we start to open things up and we get more engaged, so as long as we follow certain protocols in the community, we're able to re-engage and have those in-person support groups with our communities. And so I look forward to working with the organizations that are present here today too, so that we can coordinate those services. But for those of you that are in the Zoom link, knowing that if you're not in the, in the area, that we still have supported systems in Fort Bris and Laredo and so on, and that we can definitely support you in the same likeness and, and make sure that we provide the resources that our families need um, right now. Our, our training for facilitators, whether you want to be a community educator or you want to, or, if, or a support group facilitator, it's all online. Everything has gone online. Oh, I think those are done, if, if, I'm not, if I'm correct, with through the area agency on aging. Maybe also Letty has had some programs for the caregiver training and so on. What does a senior need? And we as a group can advocate for that, whether it be a training. Uh, I know we have uh, AARP has training for seniors on how to drive when they're older. Things change. Um, and uh, Alzheimer's. A lot of things are online, and, and uh, medicine is right. We're very fortunate that we can get to our places, can connect through the internet or have phones, but there are a lot of people, a lot of people that don't have that luxury. It's a luxury. They can't afford the internet or have one of the phones that they give out to seniors. So those people... Parks and Rec has, uh, thank you, Parks and Rec has computers at just about every gym that you can go in and use. They have pool tables. They have anything you want. You can ask if it's staff. You can ask if you can have some. And they will let you know yes or no. Uh, but the city is very interested in doing something like that. We just can't find a facility that will take care of everything. And I, I don't know that we ever will, you know. Because if we put it in the middle of town, what's what, what are the southmost people going to do? Or what are the people are Alton Gore going to do? Those kinds of things, you know, you run into logistics. But thank you for coming. Thank you all are welcome to take uh, coffee. And if you all will help me clean up this place, Absolutely. I would appreciate it. Pick up everything that's on the chairs or make sure you... To pick up your things and then we'll go from there. Thanks for coming, everyone. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, to join us uh, via Zoom. I appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine, and everybody. Okay.